Hello and welcome to Written in Uncertainty, an Elder Scrolls podcast sat firmly in the grey maybe of the series universe. My name is Aramithius, and today we're discussing some of the oldest buildings on Nern, some built by the gods themselves. Some say they hold up Nern, some say they shape the land around them. Today we're asking, what are the towers and what do they do? Before we begin, I'd just like to remind everyone that this is my own understanding of the idea, and not necessarily the whole truth of the matter, although I do my best to bring in other viewpoints as well. You may have other ideas, if so, I'd absolutely love to hear them. Please leave a comment in the blog post that accompanies this cast at writteninuncertainty.wordpress.com, and I'd also be linking the sources that I quote in this podcast in that blog post, so please go through the sources and read them yourselves, rather than just taking what I say at face value, and join the conversation at the Written and Uncertainty Discord site. Server. Also, a slight additional disclaimer here, we'll be delving into some developer texts that some people may not consider canon in this podcast pretty extensively. I'm not particularly fussed about it, but if you are, feel free to discard some of the points I make when I'm quoting those texts. I discuss my approach to canon in the cast that introduced this particular series if you want my take on that. So, anyway, the towers. This is towers with a capital T. They aren't your usual mage towers where people go and sit and make spells and there's just brick and mortar. They are something else. Conduits in a way that's similar to ley lines, I guess. Although their geographical location, at least for some of them, may not be particularly important. They do a variety of things to the land and the world around them and are special for that reason. The first two towers that we know of were created by the Aedra as Nern was created. The first one was the first spike of unassailable reality, so to speak, called Adamantia or the Adamantine Tower, and the second was Red Mountain or Red Tower or Red Heart, which was created when Lorcan's heart was plucked from his chest and shot across Nern by someone, probably Auriel, if you go by the most conventional myths, and where it landed created Red Mountain, and Red Mountain then became a tower. The rest of them were created in imitation of Adamantia, in imitation of that spike of unassailable reality by the various types of Aldma. They kind of became emblematic of the schisms of the Aldma as they spread throughout Tamriel. To quote the text that introduced Towers to us, the Numantia Intercept, which we got in 2004, I think, just before Oblivion was released, but we had this posted by Michael Kirkbride on the Bethesda forums, I think, originally. To quote, As they were the most powerful of lesser spirits in the ages after the convention, and eager to emulate what they saw, the Aldma began construction of their own towers. That they built more than one shows you that they were not of one mind. Now that brings up some interesting ideas of what about what the towers can potentially be and what they can represent, but I'm just going to hold that in abeyance for now. But that expression of what the towers are as the culmination or an expression of culture is the key thing here. And they were introduced in this text called the Numantia Intercept, although there were a few hints that we got in Morrowind, I I think. The text before the Ages of Man does things like capitalising the Adamantine Tower and the Crystal Tower, whereas when it talks about the Wizard Towers of Baal Isra and those sorts of things, they're not capitalised, which makes me think that these ideas of the towers being present in something special, at the very least, was a concept that was around during Morrowind's development. But the first time that we get an actual confirmation of the towers as special things, in particular in the way that they're referenced in the Numantia Intercept, is in The Elder Scrolls V, where it gets talked about in the prophecy of the dragonborn where the the last words of the of the poem almost at the end of the book of the dragonborn is all about the towers it talks about the brass tower and the red tower and the white tower and the snow tower which 
references very much to what was talked about in the Numantia Intercept. It talks about it not quite in those terms that they're given in the Intercept, but in terms that are similar enough that you can identify them. Just so that we can get it clear, I want to lay out what the towers that we know of so far are, and what they're called, where they are. I'm just going to give a brief summary now. The ones that we know of, the first tower, the Spike of Unassailable Reality, as it's called in the Intercept, is Adamantia, the Adamantine Tower, which is in High Rock on the island of Balfira. Red Heart, or the Red Tower, is the Red Mountain in Morrowind. Uh, Snow Throat, or the Throat of the World, is in Skyrim. Green Sap, or Falinesti, is in Valenwood. And Crystal Like Law, or the Crystal Tower, is in Somerset. Walk Brass, or the New Midium, is mobile and has been in various places throughout Tamriel's history. The Orichalk Tower was in Yokuda, and White Gold is in Cyrodiil. We also possibly have some other towers that have attempted to imitate these in the Doom Spire in High Rock and the Coral Tower in Thras, but I'll get to those a bit later. They're not really towers for now. So what do towers do? What what are these marvellous structures that everyone seems to talk about? And even within the lore, tower lore is this big thing where scholars go Ooh, and start stroking their chins and stuff. The most common theory is that they hold up Mundus. That's what you'll hear most people saying, that the towers are the things that are keeping Mundus stable and solid. And that's derived from this particular portion of the Numantia Intercept. They are magical and physical echoes of the Ur Tower, Adamantia. Adamantia was the first spike of unassailable reality in the dawn, otherwise called the Zero Stone. The powers at Adamantia were able to determine through this stone the spread of creation and their parts in it. And if Adamantia's defining characteristic is unassailable reality, is making things solid and real, and the other towers are echoes of it, then they're all acting as spikes of unassailable reality in their own way. So they're creating little reality zones, if you like, um, amid the sea of chaos that Mundus would otherwise be. So we get from we get from that that it's potentially holding up Mundus, although it's not immediately obvious. It's stated in the Elder Scrolls novels in somewhat plainer terms, although it's possibly a little vague. In the Infernal City, we have this passage. Well, some think that the White Gold Tower and some other towers around Tamriel help, well, hold the world up or something like that. Others believe that before the dragon broke, the tower helped protect us from invasion from oblivion. It holds up the world, I'm not saying it right, he replied, realising he couldn't actually remember the details of that tutorial. They help keep Mundus, the world, from dissolving back into oblivion, or something like that. Anyway, everyone seems to agree that it has power, but no one knows exactly what kind. And if we go to some other sources, when we think about this particular tower, they're talking about the white gold tower here. Lady Cinnabar in Subtropical Cyrodiil, a speculation, says that the White Gold Tower has reality-affirming properties. I think it's possible that it's just the first two, that it's just Adamantia and Red Heart that potentially stabilise Mundus, because if it wasn't those two and it needs the other ones, well, how was the world stable enough for the Oldmer to build their other towers? How was there a stable reality? And part of that, I think, is connected to how the world unfolded after convention. We have this particular passage from the text Before the Ages of Man. When Magic, Magnus, architect of the plans for the mortal world, decided to terminate the project, the gods convened at the Adamantine Tower, Dereni Tower, the oldest known structure on Tamriel, and decided what to do. Most left when Magic did. Others sacrificed themselves into other forms that they might stay, the Elnafe. 
Lorcan was condemned by the gods to exile in the mortal realms, and his heart was torn out and cast from the tower, where it landed a volcano formed. With magic, in the mythic sense, gone, the cosmos stabilised. Elven history, finally linear, began. So, we see there that the creation of Red Tower is the final act of making the cosmos stable and potentially introducing new elements to it. The text itself credits Magnus leaving and magic leaving, making the place a bit more stable. So maybe it's not even the towers after Adamantia. So there is that. But there's also the element of the Red Tower may have introduced mortality, or at least the act of creating the Red Tower in the murder of Lokan being the act which introduced mortality as a concept into Mundus, which is an interesting little aside, but not directly to do with the towers. The other towers are built by various kinds of mer. They are merithic towers, so to speak, and each expresses the various cultural goals and identity of the mer that created them. And again, from the Numantia Intercept, we have the old Mer began to split along cultural lines on how to best spread creation and their parts in it. Each tower that was built exemplified a separate accordance. And you remember the earlier quote, which talked about building multiple towers and how they didn't build one, and so they were not of one mind. They were saying, well, this is us. This is the ultimate expression of us and who we are now. The building of each new tower is essentially a split of the old Mer into something else. And as another text to kind of back that up, we have Arabic Enigma, the Elden Tree, and I'm probably garbling that horribly in the terms of the first word. The quote is, The Ald Mary or Merithic Elves were singular of purpose only so long as it took them to realise that other towers with their own stones could tell different stories, each following rules inscribed by the Verorium architects. And so the Mer self-refracted, each to their own creation, the Chimer following Red Heart, the Bosma Burgeon in Green Sap, the Altmer erecting crystal-like lore et alia. And so you have that idea of each of the towers becoming the expression of each type of Aldmer, and both as a cause and a consequence of the fracturing of Aldmeris, so to speak, which is an interesting topic of its own, and I won't go off on one. There's also the idea that the towers each shape their local reality, and act as a geographic locus and focus of everything as well as being an expression and stabilization of the culture again from arabic enigma the spike of adamantia and its zero stone dictated the structure of reality in its arabic vicinity defining for the earth bones their story or nature within the unfolding of the dragon's time-bound tale so if we follow that idea it's saying that Adamantia, the tower, is defining physics and reality for everything around it. And again, from Subtropical Cyrodiil, a speculation. I would posit that, through their collective possession of such towers in their realms, over time the elves actually amended their local reality to conform to their desires. So, not just expressing who they are and what they are to themselves and others in a mythic sense and focusing that idea and being an expression of that idea but that the towers affect the reality around it make it conform to that cultural ideal and um, Lady Cinnabar goes on to express it a little further here thus the Somerset archipelago in the sphere of the crystal tower is a warm and paradisical domain perfectly adapted to the Altmer and Cyrodiil in the sphere of the even more powerful white gold tower became a warm subtropical jungle which suited the ease loving aliens but then the slaves of the heartland high elves rose up against their masters conquered the valley of the Nibonae, and the aliens ruled no more 
Thereafter, White Gold Tower was the centre of a human empire, populated by Needs and Syro Nords who originated in cooler northern climes, and so the Tower of Cyrodiil responded to the desires of its new masters. Valritz made a really good post about this on the TS Law subreddit um, that kind of worked through the potential implications of this. I'll be linking it in the blog, but for now, keep it in mind. We'll be discussing it a, in a bit more detail later. So we're getting the idea that the towers are all exemplifying a specific accordance, to use the intercept terms. And in accordance with that, they are doing different things. They are saying that the Aelids are not the Ultima, that the Ultima are not the Aelids, and that the Kaima are neither. They're of course going to look different, they're going to project a different atmosphere, they're going to be able to have different capabilities if you like. But again, the core thing is they are an expression of each race's truth and as I mentioned in the cast on Chim, the idea of imposing your reality upon reality is what truth is in the Elder Scrolls. It's saying that you are willing reality to be a particular way and then forcing reality to comply with those particular desires. And the towers are absolutely about that. The only unified purpose that the Merithic towers really have is the imitation of Adamantia, the, the desire for Mundus to still be Mundus, so to speak. We also have, from the Intercept, the idea that they harvest Creatia from Oblivion, which is a function of their stones, which have come up in a few of the quotes. So, what is Creatia, first of all? It's not Magicka, it's something else. It's discussed in a piece in the Lawmaster's Archive, which I'll link in the blog post alongside this podcast, and a text called the Azure Plasm. It's the raw stuff of oblivion from which creation is, has emerged. It's raw potential, uh, which can then be used and bent and shaped in whatever ways. If you think about Mundus being a ball of, well, not even a ball of clay, that idea doesn't, doesn't really work. But if you think about Mundus being ice, maybe, creation is the water from which it emerged, the, the waters of oblivion, if you want to get poetic about it. Towers also have their stones, which are echoes of the zero stone of Adamantia, as the other towers echo Adamantia, at least according to the Numantia Intercept. Stones dictate things about the towers, and they are the source of their power. They're kind of the on switch in, in several ways. And you c change the stone of the tower, and you change the the th tower itself. There's mention in the Elden Tree text that the aliens who arrived in Valenwood were then trying to change the perchance acorn, which is the stone of green sap, and hoping to make another white gold tower um, in so doing. And the idea of the stone being the conduit of the creatia and in a way dictating how it's shaped. If we go back to the metaphor of creation as water, the shape of the stuff that you pour the water into is dictated by the tower's stone, if that makes sense. We don't have concrete stones for all of the towers. We have the zero stone of Adamantia being convention. That's been confirmed. The perchance acorn of green sap has been confirmed as a stone and the Amulet of Kings as the White Gold Tower's particular stone have all been explicitly stated in some text or other. Others are a matter of pure speculation. I started off talking about the differences for the towers, and I think this is probably the best chance to do that, go over those differences, and then talk about what each of the stones does in line with that, so that you can get a sense of the different towers, the different stones, how they interact and how they've evolved. So if we kick off with the first tower, Adamantia, or the Adamantine Tower, uh, its stone is convention itself. It's that event of 
deciding that creation was going to carry on, that the gods were going to exist in this reality. We know that there is power in the place that leads to the Zero Stone. It's called an aperture in the text that discusses the approach to the stone. I think, I think it's called Once, but I'll look up some more details and post them in the blog post alongside this. But we don't know a lot more than that about it. The Direni elves who lived um, on Balifura and Han High Rock tried to harness its power but they didn't really have much success. It was kind of a rite of passage for the big Direni families that at least once in their life too, well actually just once in their life generally, that they would go down to the Zero Stone and try and work out how to harness all the power that was in there but none of them really pulled it off. The first, well, these, there's technically the second tower, but the first stone, bizarrely enough, in the Numantia Intercept. The Zero Stone is the Zero Stone, and Stone 1 is the first stone, so you go 0 and then you go 1. That's Red Heart, Red Tower, Red Mountain. And its stone is the Heart of Lorcan, after it was shot there by Auriel or flung there by Akatosh or by Trinomac or whoever dealt with it. There's all sorts of myths in, um, in there about that. The heart acted as the stone of the tower and created the tower where it landed. It's pretty much the only example we have of the stone creating the tower itself. And there wasn't really a lot that really could be done with the heart of Lorcan, if you like. Uh, the Dwemer tapped it and were trying to mess around with the tones that it produced and that sort of thing. I think the Kaima and later the Dunma are possibly a better expression of Lorcan and Lorcan's plan. If you look at the Chimeri Exodus and the kind of messages that Boethia was talking about to Veloth, the Triangle Truth and other things, then the Kaima and the Dunma are an expression of Lorcan's goal and Lorcan's plan in a way that other cultures really haven't been. So them being in the same place as the heart of Lorcan is kind of appropriate. The next tower that I'm going to go to, because we have no order outside of the two divine towers really, is Snow Throat, the Throat of the World, which is a bit of a weird one because we don't know who built it. It's not a Merethic one, but it's not explicitly mentioned as a divine tower, so to speak. It's not one that the Aedra specifically created. We don't know how it started, but given that the Nords consider that they were born there when they were breathed out by Kine or some such, it's possible that Kine created it, or at least that's the closest we can get to it in terms of a creation point for it there's been an awful lot more speculation about what the stone of Snowthroat is, with Skyrim being the first game that really confirmed the towers as a thing, Snowthroat and the Throat of the World being where the game happened, we've got an awful lot more ideas. And we've also got from the Book of the Dragonborn that it lies sundered, kingless and bleeding. So... What does that mean for what the stone is? If the stone is the core expression of the tower, what is sundered, kingless, and bleeding at the time of the Elder Scrolls V? Again, it, it's not something that we really know. But it may well be the Nords themselves, if you take it literally. It's the expression of that most mannish race of men, which is a little weird given that towers are most often associated with myrrh, but there you are. We do have some comments from Michael Kirkbride saying that he intended it to be a cave and that got very very heavily speculated about in all sorts of directions. The most obvious one is you then look at Blackreach and, and Ethereum maybe? I really don't think so personally unless you start maybe looking at the Ethereal Forge and that sort of thing. But quite how that connects to the throat of the world and the kind of myth echoes that we generally associate with towers, I don't really see it myself, but it's been posited as a possibility. 
from there, we've gone to the point that the caves are generally metaphorical. You're talking either Plato's cave and the allegory of the cave there, that that reality is a shadow of a greater reality, a truer reality, which doesn't feel that much like the Elder Scrolls, unless you then want to go on to, well, you then look at the wheel and the tower and that side of things, which, again, I don't know, that doesn't really sit right with me. Although that said, there's the idea that within the story of Plato's allegory of the cave, just to give a quick recap, you've got people looking at flickering shadows on the wall of a cave that's only got a fire going on, and they've seen that those flickering shadows for so long that they think that, that sh- those shadows are reality. Eventually, someone breaks free and goes outside, sees the real world, sees that the shadows that they've been seeing are just pale reflections of the things moving around outside the cave, and that person then goes back, tells all the other people about it, who don't believe him, and kill him. If we then look at that within the context of the Elder Scrolls, you've got Lorcan seeing the eye that is the tower in one of Michael Kirkbride's texts. Again, I can't remember entirely what it is, I think. It's Vex teaching, but I will look it up and post it in the blog post alongside this cast, so you can check that out and go through it. There's also another cave that has been used as a metaphor for this, the cave of Carl Jung, which is almost an elaboration of Joseph Campbell's ideas, I suppose, or maybe something prior to Campbell, and almost Star Wars now I think about it, that Jung's cave is a place of transformation. It is somewhere that you go to undergo an ordeal and emerge as a new and different thing. So with those sorts of things in mind, are we looking at Snow Throat as a reflection of reality as a whole? I'm not sure. Jung's cave as a place of transformation, Snow Throat and the Vessel of Men as a thing to transform reality as a whole, that idea I could get behind. It's quite its quite a nice fit for the mythic role of men, if you like. I think we possibly got to leave that idea there, because I've not thought it through that much. But on to the next tower. The green sap, also called Falanesti. The stone for that is the perchance acorn. Green sap has been called manifold and several because it could have been different things, and because it could have been different things, it was lots of different things. Quite a bit like the Bosma race in that they took forever to find a definite form, and that they can also be a lot of different shapes and so on. They can have antlers, they can have all sorts of bestial features, and they can transform into a formless mass as part of the wild hunt. The perchance acorn being the stone is something that has been pretty much confirmed in the text, but when we discussed the Bosma culture on the Selective's Lawcast recently, the idea was put up that the stone of green sap was the sap of the trees, and that idea of kind of flowing and changing and being an expression of the whole ecosystem itself feels quite a nice fit, but I've got precisely nothing outside of tinfoil hat speculation to, to support that idea. Crystal-like lore is the next one in Somerset, the Crystal Tower, the apex of Ultima Civilization for an awfully long time. The stone was revealed to be transparent lore, a crystal, thanks to El- the Elder Scrolls Online. It was claimed to by Michael Kirkbride to be a person before that. Elder Scrolls Online solved this, if you want to see it that way, in a really nice way. Spoilers for Elder Scrolls Online Somerset, by the way, before we go any further. The head of the Sijic Order, the Rite Master Iachesis, had transparent lore hidden in his chest, which feels very much like a nod to Kirkbride's comment that it was a person at one point because it was in a person. There's a text that talks about transparent law being an expression of the perfection of the Ultima 
and all that sort of thing. It's called the Crystal of the Tower, and we have this from it. Obviously, theories concerning the transparent lore and its significance to the Crystal Tower abound within the College of Sapiarchs. I like to believe that the crystal absorbs the drive for perfection that marks the Ultima and reflects it back, driving away any imperfections that would weaken or endanger the island. Not everyone agrees with me, but I see a correlation between the pride and admiration our people feel for the Crystal Tower and the feeling of security and safety that it in turn projects across the land. It is a symbiotic relationship. Or it could just be ancient Ultima magic, who can really say? So we have that idea of the crystal-like law and the stone of crystal-like law being an expression of that perfection and to an extent almost the very notion of a crystal as a perfectly formed thing. If you think about the structure of a crystal in terms of its molecules, they're very, very precisely aligned. They have to be in particular ways in order to be a crystal, they're only formed under particular geological circumstances and so on and so forth. The, the idea of crystal kind of reflects perfection as an idea anyway. And one of the other things that the Elder Scrolls Online has brought up with regard to the Crystal Tower is that it is able to exist in all planes at once. We have this dialogue from Sotha Sil in the Elder Scrolls Online. The Crystal Tower exists on multiple planes of reality simultaneously and possesses capabilities we do not fully understand. In response to another bit of dialogue, Sothasil also says, The tower straddles every reality. Its true purpose remains lost in time, but I theorise it was created as a watchtower of sorts, a doorway to everywhere. It stands to reason, then, that the tower is the key to omnipresence. Now, we don't quite know what omnipresence means in this sense. There's the sense that we have there from multiple planes of reality that it could potentially also exist in Oblivion or in all the different realms of Oblivion, as well as Mundus. It may also exist in Aetherius and all the various derivatives thereof. Or it could, given that Sothasil also talks about crystal tower giving someone infinite options in places to be and straddling every reality when we get the sense that oblivion is part of the same reality that is the Arabus, then the crystal tower could in theory straddle different timelines maybe allow you to dimension hop in a way that we haven't really seen before in the elder scrolls and there's also the use of the word multiverse here which also hints at that particular interpretation here what that precisely means for what Crystal Tower is, it's projecting a spike of unassailable reality, if we can go back to that language, everywhere. It is making sure that there is reality everywhere and there is a particular kind of reality everywhere, which is a very, very big, loud pronouncement of the way that things should be. It again echoes that driving for perfection, which the other towers don't really in that reality is going to be this way everywhere which is a really interesting idea it's the idea of something being so present and perfect almost which now i think about it again links up with ideas that were happening in the ooh, i want to say the 16th 17th century in terms of how people thought about philosophical arguments for the existence of god leibniz in particular put forward an argument that it was the idea of perfection and the idea of God being present at all which meant that there was a God. And if you think about transparent law in that way, if you're thinking about the idea of perfection being something that transcends planes, that transcends particular realms of existence, that could potentially be a reason for why. If you're looking for a central anchor point, a central ambition to strive towards, perfection in whatever form, in whatever place, is a good thing to strive for, which is possibly where they were going with the idea of transparent law and the Crystal Tower being everywhere at once. The next tower that I've got on my list is Warkbrass, the Numidium. 
which was made by the Dwemer in an attempt to make a new god and make themselves a new god um, to transcend back up the creational gradients and make themselves level with the other original spirits. If you want to hear more about that, please go back and listen to my podcast on what happened to the Dwemer. I go into quite a bit of detail about what I think New Medium is and how it works. But I'm only going to cover things in a little bit in brief here. But the Stone of Walk Brass was originally potentially the heart of Lorcan um, because that's how it was designed. It was meant to be powered by the heart of Lorcan as part of its design, but it was never activated in that way. So if there's been a kind of fan consensus that considers the Mantella, the big soul gem that was created by Tiber Septim specifically to power the new medium as being its stone. Now this implies that the stones of a tower can be changed, can be switched around and messed with in various ways, which almost feels like it shouldn't be able to be done, that towers and stones are inviolable reality, that once they are set in place they are rock solid, never to be shaken until they fall maybe. But we do have some senses that things like this can be altered. If we go back to the Arabic Enigma text again, it tells about how the Aelids in Valenwood are trying to change green sap into another version of white gold, and in doing so, alter, altering the stone, playing around with the perchance acorn, and all that sort of thing. So it's possible from that that you can switch out one stone for another, and thereby maybe change what a particular tower is about. So that might almost be an explanation as to why the new medium was used in the way it was. It potentially wasn't a tool for conquest, but it was also used in that way by Tiber Septim to conquer Tamriel and help him to rule. And it could also be why things go a little haywire if you then look at what happens with the new medium in Coda. It comes back and destroys the whole world pretty much, or at least wrecks it to a quite a great extent. It's that expression to conquer, to dominate, that could possibly be part of it. And then you've also got various other bits that link into the Dwemer's philosophy of negation and world refusal and saying that nothing is real, all kind of playing into what the new medium becomes. The idea that there's an awful lot of no, you shall not exist, and it is so, and how the new medium is portrayed in Coda. But we don't really know enough about the original structure and purpose and intent of the new medium to be able to say that for sure. It's just the way things seem at the moment. If we then look at white gold, the Amulet of Kings has been specifically called out in several places as the stone of white gold tower. And it was designed to ape the structure of Mundus and thereby control it. If we think about the way the Arabis is structured, the way that it's most commonly put across is that it's as a wheel, that Mundus is the hub of the wheel, the eight gift limbs, the Adra that stabilize it, are the spokes of the wheel, and then everything that surrounds it is the rim, so to speak. And if we then look at how it's presented in the Numantia Intercept, we have this quote about what the White Gold Tower is. Though the Aelids gave theirs a central spire as the imago of Adamantia, the whole of the Polydox resembled the wheel, with eight lesser towers forming a ring around their primus. To dismiss this mythic texture as being a mockery of the Arabis is to ignore an important point. This same jest gave White Tower a power over Creatia, unlike any on this plane yet. It was a triumph of sympathetic mega-fetish, and the start of the threat to empire that brings me to this council. If the Aeliad made their own wheel within the wheel, 
Werweb ad semblio, what would happen if they plucked its strings? Now there's there's a few bits in there that I want to unpack a bit. The first being the phrase sympathetic mega fetish. This is not just jargon that's been smashed together, although I think it's possibly a bit tautological maybe. Sympathetic here is used in the sense of one thing being like or feeling like or expressing something similar to something else. It's the idea of as above so below which is a cornerstone in hermetic philosophy which is why alchemists turn lead into gold as part of the way of transforming their souls into something else. It's why voodoo dolls are used. You make something that looks like the other person and do things to that doll with the ex expectation that the person will then have those effects mapped out. That's what a fetish is. It's also termed a poppet in some traditions. Slight divergence here. The term fetish originally got its sexual meaning from the works of Sigmund Freud. It was the observation that some people got sexual pleasure not from the act of sex itself, but from something else which stood in for sex. They would do something with a particular object which they had fetishized, which they had associated with sex on some level, which then gave them their sexual pleasure. They made a fetish for sex out of something else, so they did something which turned them on and that gave them sexual pleasure. They were doing something to something in the expectation of sexual pleasure happening. That's where the word gets its more modern usage, if you like. But it still has this more ancient meaning of you do something to something in the expectation that it happens to something else. But that's that's the basic idea of a sympathetic mega fetish is. The aliens made a model of the entire Arabis, and so by modifying the structure of that tower, by adjusting it, doing whatever they, they were doing to it, they would then hope to adjust the Arabis itself. I think this is probably a good point to bring up an artifact that was also constructed by an alien in the in imitation of the towers to also alter the structure of Mundus. The staff of towers was made by a numeral with segments and parts that were either made from the towers or made in imitation of the towers. It's not entirely clear what from the sources, but it was made to help the Aelids control wherever they were and do things to Mundus. It was broken apart pretty much as soon as it was constructed, and there's a big part in Elder, Elder Scrolls Online Somerset about take it, making sure that the Staff of Towers is once again in pieces and it can never be used again. But it was used at one point in history to alter the fundamental structure of Mundus. We have the Murakati Selectives using it, which was, I think, in this world chronologically, the first time the Staff of Towers was mentioned, that they assembled this thing out of eight pieces and used it as part of their ritual to break the dragon in the first era and reassemble the bits of Akatosh. So even these imitations of towers built in this particular way can be used to shape reality. There's also a comment that got made by Michael Kirkbride which possibly apes this sort of idea. I can't remember where it is. I've looked for it. I can't find it. But it was the idea of the Thalmor potentially using the White Gold Tower to shoot Talos out of heaven. And if you can do that by plucking on the strings of the White Gold Tower, so to speak, by adjusting the wheel, by doing something to it, then you have a power over reality in the same way that several magic traditions in this world have suggested for quite a while. The final tower is the one we know the least about, really. The Orichalk Tower of Yokuda. We don't even know what its stone is, or what it even could be at this point. 
because Yakuda is sunk and no one really wants to talk about it that much. Although it may well be that there's some link between Orichalcum and Orichalcum, the metal, it would kind of feel that way. When the Red Guards first developed Orichalcum or found Orichalcum, either way, they attached a Prometheus type story to it. One of their gods, Diagna, if I remember right, um, found Orichalcum and brought it to them as part of a way of ending their war with the left handed elves. And so it's possible that the finding and production of Orichalcum itself is in some way connected to the Orichalc Tower, that the use of Orichalcum is in some way an expression of the Red Guard people and their culture. But again, I don't honestly know. That's all the examples that we have of towers that are definitely towers. If we can now think back to the notion that we talked about a bit earlier about imitation towers, we have two of these possibly. The Doom Spire or Doom Crag in High Rock and the Coral Tower of Thras. It's said in one of the loading screens for the Elder Scrolls Online that Thrastus of Elnir said that Morichelis speculated that the Aelids who built the Great Spire above Eroki were attempting to create a metaphysical structure that would be a focus of Arabic power, much as the Adamantine Tower is said to be. I have no idea what that means. That, again, would fit with the story that we have um, in Arabic Enigma, um, that the Aelids, once they were displaced from Cyrodiil and ran to High Rock, they were then attempting to rebuild their civilization, rebuild their culture by constructing another white gold tower or another tower to try and re-establish themselves as a cultural power, as something that has influence over the areas that they find themselves in. But we don't have much more apart from that loading screen to go off, unfortunately. It's, it really feels like it should be the case that that's what they were trying to do, but we don't know that much else. The Coral Tower of Thras connected to the Slodes is another one, and it may be an imitation. Um, again, if we draw parallels to other towers that we know, there's a version of the Coral Tower in Cold Harbor as well as on as well as the on Nern. And thinking about how the Crystal Tower can be everywhere, it's a possibility, but this has explicitly been called out as not something that is very sure in the Elder Scrolls Online Lawmasters Archive. It's left very much as an open question. So We've again got the idea of these things that might be towers, but they might not. And now that we've gone through all the towers and possible towers, we can now think about what happens when stuff is done to them. Um, there's a lot of talk in the community about destroying the stone and deactivating towers and so on. We do have this particular pattern that seems to be emerging within the Elder Scrolls games. There's the idea of if you destroy the stone, you destroy the conduit through which the tower harnesses Creatia and renders it pretty much useless. Uh, we've got a pattern with emerging within the Elder Scrolls games that, since Daggerfall pretty much, um, that there's been a stone destroyed or a tower destroyed in some way or other. In the Elder Scrolls 2 in Daggerfall, the Mantella is lost and the new medium is destroyed, which is partly why we've got that link to the Mantella potentially being the new medium's stone. You've got the heart of Lokan being freed or unbound and possibly destroyed in the Elder Scrolls 3. And you've then got the destruction of the Amulet of Kings at the end of the Elder Scrolls 4. The Elder Scrolls V is a bit trickier. The Prophecy of the Last Dragonborn states that Snowthroat lies sundered, kingless, and bleeding at the start, but that doesn't sound like deactivated to me. There's some possibility that what, what the Last Dragonborn does to Alduin in some way deactivates the stone. It's possible that through the resolution of the time wound 
at the top of the throat of the world that the stone is destroyed there but or deactivated at least but again that's the least certain of the ones that we have and thinking further about the destruction of the stones if you remember Val Ritz's thread I highlighted earlier that thread points out that each culture has had serious problems once the tower that they've attached to has been tampered with in brief uh, the Dunma had red year after the Nereverine did stuff to the heart the Cyrodiils had the end of the Septim dynasty after the amulet was destroyed the old Altma royalty is deposed and the Thalmor rise up after crystal-like law is destroyed during the Oblivion Crisis. And there's a suggestion that the trees of Valenwood have already been altered by the Aelids meddling with the tower, that because of the Aelids interfering with Falinesti, that's why the trees don't move anymore. And so then, what would happen if all the towers were deactivated. There's this idea that if you destroy all the towers, if you remove all the stones, switch them all off, Mundus will be destroyed. I think that's possibly half right. If you take away all possible spikes of unassailable reality, it then gets you back to assailable reality. It gets you back to things that can be but don't have to be. It brings you back to a state of impermanence, which is pretty much the way that the Dawn Era was. So you've got events happening all at once. You've got nothing lasting, everything and nothing all at once. So that is kind of in line with the prevalent theory that the towers are holding up reality if you remove all unassailable reality. But I only think that would happen if adamantia were destroyed or deactivated in some way i don't think the other towers are really relevant in that particular matter because they were built while mundus was stable in effect and there's another question that keeps on getting asked in relation to the towers is do the thalmor want to topple the towers do the thalmor want to unmake mundus I want to discuss that in a bit more detail in the next episode, but for now, just the short answer from me, probably not. And that's pretty much it for this episode, our quick run through of the towers, what they do, and examples from each of them. Thank you ever so much for listening. Next time, we're going to be talking about the man mer schism, or do the Thalmor want to end the world? In the meantime, please do subscribe to this podcast on your favourite podcast catcher and join the discussion at the Written and Uncertainty Discord or leave a comment on this blog. Until next time, this podcast remains a letter written in uncertainty. You've been listening to Written in Uncertainty, a podcast written and presented by Aramithius with some very kind editorial help from Cyfrey. The music for this cast is by Jan Glimbotsky. Check them out on SoundCloud at Songs from the Lost Land, I'll see you next time.